Without, the night was cold and wet, but in the small parlour of Laburnum Villa, the blinds were drawn and the fire burnt brightly. Father and son were at chess. Hark at the wind, Herbert, said Mr. White. I'm listening, replied his son. I should hardly think that he'd come tonight, said his father. The front gate banged and heavy footsteps came towards the door. There he is, said Herbert, and he rose to let him in. Sergeant Major Morris, he said, introducing a tall, burly man. The soldiers shook hands, and taking the proffered seat by the fire, watched contentedly while his host got out whisky and tumblers. At the third glass, the stranger's eyes got brighter, and he began to talk of wild scenes and doughty deeds in India, of wars and plagues and strange peoples. What was that you started telling me the other day about a monkey's paw? Nothing, said the soldier. Leastways, nothing worth hearing. Monkey's paw, said Mrs. White curiously. To look at, said the sergeant major, fumbling in his pocket, it's just an ordinary little paw, dried to a mummy, and he showed it to his guests. It had a spell put on it by a fakir, a very holy man, said the sergeant major. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives, and that those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it. Well, why don't you have three, sir? said Herbert White. I have, the soldier said quietly. And did you have the three wishes granted? asked Mrs. White. I did. And has anybody else wished? persisted the old lady. Well, the first man had his three wishes. I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. That's how I got the paw. A hush fell upon the group. If you've had your three wishes, it's no good to you now, said the old man at last. What do you keep it for? The soldier shook his head. Fancy, I suppose. I did have some idea of selling it, but it's caused enough mischief already. Mr. White snatched it. If you don't want it, give it to me. I won't, said the soldier. If you keep it, don't blame me for what happens. Pitch it on the fire like a sensible man. The other examined his new possession closely. How do you do it? he inquired. Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud, but I warn you of the consequences. Mr. White dropped the paw in his pocket and motioned his friend to the table. Over supper the talisman was forgotten, and the three listened to more of the soldiers' adventures in India. The front door closed behind their guest in time for him to catch the last train, and Mr. White took the paw from his pocket. I don't know what to wish for, and that's a fact, he said slowly. It seems to me I've got all I want. Well, if you cleared the money owing on the house, then you'd be happy, wouldn't you? said his son. Wish for two hundred pounds. His father held up the talisman. I wish for two hundred pounds, said the old man. It moved, he cried. As I wished, it twisted in my hand like a snake. Well, I don't see the money, said his son, as he picked up the paw and placed it on the table, and I bet I never shall. He bade them good night. In the brightness of the wintry sun next morning, Mr. White laughed at his fears, and the dirty, shriveled little paw was pitched on the sideboard with a carelessness which betokened no great belief in its virtues. The idea of our listening to such nonsense, said Mrs. White. How could wishes be granted? And if they could, how could two hundred pounds hurt you? He said that things happened so naturally that you might attribute it to coincidence. Well, don't spend all the money before I come back, said Herbert, as he rose from the table. 
I'm afraid it'll turn you into a mean, avaricious man, and we shall have to disown you. His mother laughed, and following him to the door, watched her son down the road, and returning to the breakfast table, was very happy at the expense of her husband's credulity. All of which did not prevent her from scurrying to the door that evening at the postman's knock, only to find that he had brought a tailor's bill. Herbert will make more of his funny remarks, I expect, when he comes home. But as Mrs. White said this, she was watching the mysterious movements of a man outside, who, peering in at the house, appeared to be trying to make up his mind to enter. Three times he paused at the gate, and then walked on again. The fourth time he stood with his hand upon it, and then with sudden resolution flung it open and walked up the path. Mrs. White brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room. "'I was asked to call,' he said. "'I come from Moore and Meggins.' The old lady started. "'Is anything the matter? Has anything happened to Herbert?' "'I'm sorry,' began the visitor. "'Is he hurt?' demanded the mother. "'Badly hurt,' he said quietly. "'But he's not in any pain.' "'Oh, thank God!' said the old woman, clasping her hands. "'Thank God for that! Thank—' She broke off suddenly, as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned upon her. "'He was caught in the machinery.' "'Caught in the machinery,' repeated Mr. White. "'Yes. The firm wished me to convey their sincere sympathy with you in your loss.' I beg that you will understand I am only their servant, and merely obeying orders." There was no reply. The old woman's face was white, her eyes staring, and her breath inaudible. Moore and Meggins admit no liability at all, but in consideration of your son's services they wish to present you with a certain sum as compensation. Mr. White dropped his wife's hand and gazed with a look of horror at his visitor. How much? Two hundred pounds. In the cemetery, some two miles distant, the old couple buried their son. In the days that followed, sometimes they hardly exchanged a word. They had nothing to talk about. It was about a week after that the old man waking suddenly in the night, stretched out his hand and found himself alone. The room was in darkness, and the sound of subdued weeping came from the window. "'Come back,' he said tenderly. "'You'll get cold.' "'It's cold for my son,' said the old woman, and she wept afresh. He dozed fitfully. "'The poor!' she cried wildly. The monkey's poor! He started up in alarm. Where? Where is it? What's the matter? She tumbled across the room toward him. I want it, she said quietly. You've not destroyed it. Oh, it's in the parlour. Why? She cried and laughed together, and bending over kissed his cheek. I only just thought of it. Why didn't I think of it before? Why didn't you think of it? Think of what? he questioned. The other two wishes. Was one not enough? No, she cried triumphantly. We'll have one more. Go down and get it and wish our boy alive again. We had the first wish granted, why not the second? Good God, you're mad, he cried. Go and get it and wish. The old man turned and regarded her, and his voice shook. He's been dead ten days, and besides, he, I could only recognise him by his clothing. If he was too terrible for you to see then, how now? Bring him back, cried the old woman, and dragged her husband toward the door. He went down in the darkness. The talisman was in its place, and a horrible fear seized him that the unspoken wish might bring his mutilated son before him ere he could escape from the room. He groped along the wall, 
until he found himself in the small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand. His wife seemed changed as he entered the room, and he was afraid of her. Wish, she cried. It's foolish and wicked. Wish, she repeated. He raised his hand. I wish my son alive again. And he sank trembling into a chair. He sat until he was chilled with the cold, glancing occasionally at his wife who was peering out through the window. The candle, which had burned to a stump, was throwing shadows on the ceiling, and then it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed, and the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke. The darkness was oppressive, and after lying for some time screwing up his courage, he took the box of matches and, striking one, went downstairs for another candle. At the foot of the stairs the match went out, and as he struck another there was a knock, so quiet as to be scarcely audible, sounding on the front door. The matches spilled from his hand. He stood motionless, his breath suspended until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled back to the bedroom. A third knock sounded through the house. "'What's that?' cried the old woman. Another loud knock resounded through the house. "'It's Herbert!' she screamed. "'It's Herbert!' She ran to the door, but her husband was before her, and catching her by the hand, held her tightly. "'It's my boy! It's Herbert!' she cried, struggling mechanically. "'I forgot the cemetery was two miles away. Let me go. I must open the door. For God's sake, don't let it in!' He was trembling. "'You're afraid of your own son? Let me go! I'm coming, Herbert! I'm coming!' There was another knock and another, and the old woman broke free and ran from the room. Her husband heard the front door chain rattle back, and the bottom bolt drawn slowly and stiffly from the socket. "'The top bolt!' she shouted. "'Come down! I can't reach it!' But her husband was on his hands and knees, groping wildly on the floor in search of the paw. Knocks reverberated through the house, and he heard the scraping of a chair as his wife put it down in the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back, and at that moment he found the monkey's paw and frantically breathed his third and last wish. The knocking ceased. He heard the chair drawn back and the door opened. A cold wind rushed up the staircase, and a loud wail of misery from his wife gave him courage to run down to her side and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp flickering opposite shone on a quiet and deserted road. <laughs>